Welcome back to Elite Exotic Essentials. In today's video, I'm going to, I'm going to do a reaction to Film Theory, Star Wars, How the Mandalorian Prove the Empire Was Right. So, the Mandalorian, if you don't know, is Star Wars, but it takes place after Return of the Jedi. And there's a new character who's a Mandalorian. He's a bounty hunter. And he's tasked with, we all know, with protecting Baby Yoda and taking him back to the Jedi. So let's see what the Empire did right. Let's start. Okay, let's go. Here's a fun fact. At the 2007 American Psychiatric Association's annual meeting, a psychiatrist by the name of Eric Bui argued that Anakin Skywalker meets six of the nine diagnostic criteria for borderline personality disorder. Mm. One more than the five needed for an official diagnosis. Now, I bring this up for two reasons. First, to show that I'm not the... Oh, the cookie I'm eating is carnival. You probably don't care, but still only crazy person out there applying real-world diagnostics to fictional worlds, but secondly, to emphasize a point I made in my previous Star Wars theories, the Jedi are low-key the bad guys of the prequel films. Studies of borderline personality disorder have found that 31 and 58% of cases are caused by environmental conditions, factors like emotional and physical abuse and neglect. For instance, a young child being whisked away from his only living parents at a young age and not being allowed to see them again while being told to repress all emotion, just like what happens to Anakin. Anakin, in the first movie, is a confident, self-reliant young man. Sure, he and his mother live in slavery, but they're getting by just fine. Fast forward to him after years of Jedi training, and suddenly he's impulsive, insecure, emotionally stunted, and unstable. All classic mm. symptoms of borderline personality disorder. Just saying that it's not just me, Joe Schmo YouTuber, saying this sort of stuff. It's teams of real-world psychiatric experts presenting their findings to other professionals out there in the field. And with all that being said, now, it's time to talk about how the Empire wasn't all that bad. Hmm. Yeah. I think there was one video, I didn't watch it, but it was talking about how under the Separatist rule, some planets weren't really that... Like, they was okay with being ruled under the Separatist. But yeah, the Jedi. Yeah, they low-key be evil, because they be taking... They taking younglings away early from their parents because they try to get them when they're young because when they're really young they're moldable and they can put in whatever ideology they want in their heads and so with that you take children away from their parents early you train them and condition them to think and believe what you want them to believe and yeah that sounds illegal it is illegal but it's fictional but it's sad Internet, welcome to Film Theory, the show that likes to play devil's advocate, or should I say dark side's advocate? The dark side of the force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. Unnatural? Sign me up! Though I thought that that oh natural stuff was overrated hippy dippy nonsense. Previously on Film Theory, we discussed the idea that maybe the Jedi aren't actually the impeccable paragons of virtue they're made out to be. Uncovering that if you step back from the biased perspective of the movies and just take an objective look at the Order's actions, a lot of it ranges from neglectful to abusive to downright exploitative. At the very least, consider this. In Rise of Skywalker, we're given this whole subplot about Finn and Janna being raised and indoctrinated into the stormtrooper ranks. You were first order. Not by choice. We were conscripted as kids. I was TZ-1719. FN-2187. You! Yeah. I never knew there were more. This is seen as a bad action in the world of these movies, and yet the Jedi Order has been doing mm. the exact same thing since the prequels. It yeah. is a foundational part of their recruitment. You used to be trained then? No, it will not be trained. No. Too old. We just never see it that way because the movies bias us against that point of view. Which is why today, I'd like to take it one step further. The Empire wasn't all that bad. The entire Galactic Republic was a failure. It was riddled with flaws. To put it simply, the hard truth is this. The galaxy was better off under the rule of Palpatine. Now, we're not talking about blowing up planets. Admittedly, that was a pretty huge evil thing, and we're gonna get to that. But really, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the daily lives of ordinary citizens. The everyday moisture farmers well, you gotta think about it. Is blowing up a couple planets really that bad? Of course, you got living people and they got lives, but how do you know those planets are really doing good? They're really sustainable. 
You can just evacuate all the people off, relocate them. They can start a new home with their families. I believe you can do it. They're minding their own business in their little corner of the universe. Sure, behind closed doors, Emperor Palpatine is secretly a Sith Lord who can shoot lightning bolts from his hands. Definitely seems evil, but no one knows that. Heck, that'd be like if the President of the United States was secretly a member of the Illuminati. You'd never know. I mean, seriously, maybe he can shoot lightning from his hands. <laughs> the long and short of it is this. From an outward policy perspective, the Empire wasn't all that bad, and the Republic just fails in a lot of very basic duties. But we never get to see any of this because the movie are framed with the rebellion being the heroes. And with that said, let's begin. One thing that got me thinking about all this was re-watching the first season of The Mandalorian. There was one line in the finale of season one that really caught my attention, delivered by Werner Herzog's character, The Client. The Empire improves every system it touches, judged by elementary safety, prosperity, trade opportunity, peace. Compare Imperial rule to what is happening now. Look outside. After all, mm -hmm. he's the bad guy, and from the way he says we when talking about the Empire, we can assume that he was affiliated with them, meaning of he's not exactly the most unbiased person. But the Mandalorian shows us that the client isn't the only one who seems to feel that the New Republic hasn't been doing their job of keeping the galactic peace. Look no further than this line from Episode 3 between Mando and Grief. All that are left, mercenaries and warlords, but if it bothers you, just go back to the core and report them to the New Republic. That's a joke. As a reminder, <laughs> this is a conversation that's taking place several years after the New Republic won in Return of the Jedi, replacing the rule of the Empire as the legitimate galactic government. And in this one line, we see the idea that the New Republic would actually send a peacekeeping force to Navarro is actually so laughable that Mando considers it a joke. It's almost <laughs> like that entire part of the galaxy is a neighborhood where it's not even worth calling the cops because the cops never come. The New Republic is failing in some of the most basic duties of governance here, leaving it up to Mando and his friends, the bounty hunters, to clean up the mess that the Republic is ignoring. Oh, wait, that's what the trenches is. I think I was watching this one guy. If you watch him, Daquan Wilshire, he's talking about how the trenches is like that part of the hood where not even the cops go there. So, if you compare that to Star Wars and with the New Republic, where like the Mandalorian takes place and the, like the Outer Rim, no one goes there. But the new, but with the new republic and their like pilots and their soldiers, they'd be funny. They're funny at times. Not that far off from what the client just said. All he sees is death and chaos. What we're learning here is that overthrowing a government is a whole heck of a lot easier than building up new governments to effectively replace them. In fact, places like Mandalorian's Navarro being ignored by the Republic isn't just sloppy oversight. It appears to be the Galactic Republic's full-on policy. I mean, have you ever stopped to consider what the Empire stood for, how it ruled, or what the mm -hmm. New Republic was planning on doing differently? Most Star Wars media, especially the mainstream stuff, doesn't really get into these details because it's so concerned with space wizarding adventures. Yeah, but in some of the extended universe stuff that's now considered legends, we learn from Grand Moff Tarkin five years after the formation of the Empire what the Empire's goal and structure was. In his speech outlining what's known as the Tarkin Doctrine, we get this. The factor that contributed most to the demise of the Republic was not, in fact, the war, but rampant self-interest. And in the end, left the body politic feckless and corrupt. Consider the self-interest of the core worlds, unwavering in their exploitation of the outer systems for resources. The outer yeah. systems themselves undermined by their permissive disregard of smuggling and slavery. Those ambitious members of the Senate who sought only status and opportunity. By partitioning the galaxy into regions, we, the Empire, actually achieve a unity previously absent. Where once our loyalties and allegiances were divided, they now serve one being with one goal. A cohesive galaxy Galaxy in which everyone prospers. For the first time in 1,000 generations, our sector governors will not be working solely to enrich Coruscant and the core world, but to advance the quality of life in the star systems that make up each sector, keeping mm. the spaceway safe, maintaining open and accessible communications, assuring that tax revenues are properly levied and allocated. 
allocated to improving the infrastructure. That doesn't sound all that evil. In fact, it sounds pretty sweet for the outer system planets who, based on what Tarkin is saying, was getting abused by the core worlds under the Republic system. If you can't raise money for your yeah. film, you'll never be a filmmaker. It's kind of like being an entrepreneur that can't raise money mm -hmm. for an idea. That's why I've made this video for you. The yeah. Um, it sounds like it was kind of like... Oh, yeah. I see it. Because... Yeah, I can see it. People, when you're in high position positions of power, people only care about themselves and maintaining their status and their wealth. So, they're... Yeah, so they're going to maintain and do whatever they can by any means. Even if it means... Hurting others in the process. So I see with the Empire, they were trying to make sure everyone was unified. And also with Star Wars, like, of course we don't focus, focus on, like, politics and stuff. There's politics in it, but it's like, that's kind of, that's not interesting to me, space politics. It's the war, not, well, yeah, the fighting, and, yeah, the, the space battles. That's kind of what's interesting about Star Wars. In the Hunger Games, the outer districts were stuck giving all their best resources to the capital, and they themselves were left to suffer and starve. This is exactly what we're seeing in Navarro and the Mandalorian, and it's exactly what Tarkin is saying was happening before the Empire took over. And honestly, not only does the Empire's plan sound more fair to everyone involved, but it's also a more manageable system of governance. The galaxy is a huge, massive place, so the only way to properly keep track of everyone under your guidance is to divide it up into smaller sectors to be overseen in chunks, which, reading up on the Empire, mm. is how the Moff and Grand Moff hierarchy was built. A permanent class of Moffs and regional governors were established to more efficiently govern individual sectors and regions within the Empire. That's how smaller places like Navarro don't get ignored under the Empire. And it works. As we learn about the short story The Guns of Kilroto I, the Empire mm. manages to restore order and rule of law in eight separate sectors, liberating nine 95 worlds. According to the Essential Guide for Warfare, this was a time of celebration as the rule of law gets returned to sectors that have long been taken over by piracy and crime. Citizens who are disillusioned by the corrupted Galactic Senate were now given a new home, and their name wasn't Luke Skywalker, it was, well, whatever their empire appointed local governor was. I mean, what was it that Darth Vader said to Luke again? Join me, and I will complete your training with our combined strength. Nothing about power or control. He talks about ending the conflict and bringing order to the galaxy. Luke and the other rebels might have fancied the idea of creating a better, more utopian vision where the Imperial government didn't have to rely on military might to maintain the order, but as we see in the sequels, doesn't work. Doesn't work out at all. The New Republic clearly struggles with the structure and order necessary to maintain such a huge body of governance. Not only did they fail in the short-term, five years later future that we see in The Mandalorian, but they also fail on a much bigger scale. The sequel trilogy shows us what happened under the New Republic. Somehow, under their noses, the First Order, which I should remind you is different from the structure and manning of the Empire and actually a far more evil organization, they managed to amass enough power to create a Starkiller base that just oh. completely obliterates the capital city of the New Republic. I'm sorry, did I say the capital city? I meant the capital planet. As well as wow. four others. I mean, how badly do you have to fail at defense and national security in order for that one to happen? And that is just The Force Awakens. By the time we get to The Last Jedi, somehow the Republic, which again was supposed to be a galaxy-spanning union of planets, has utterly folded under the pressure and become a ragtag group of Resistance members who are fleeing the First Order. Again, think about how crazy that is. Supposedly, one of the planets that the Rebels liberated from the Empire rule in Episode 6 was Coruscant, which has a population of one trillion sentient creatures, at least half of which are human. And now, just a couple decades later, somehow the last vestiges of the Republic stand at several hundred people strong. There's over 99.999999% of them killed off or abandoned the cause. I'm sorry, Leia, but you botched it. Don't worry, I hear your comments already. The Empire and the First Order may be different, but the Empire did also blow up Alderaan, and yeah, we can't forget about that. Are you sure? We can't forget about that because was Otteron really doing anything? Of course, I know that's one character like the in the beginning of season one of the Mandalorian. What's that? She got the haircut. 
she's from Alderaan, but like, it was it really adding any value to the universe, to the galaxy? Did it have any oil? Or Star Wars equi equivalent of oil? Does it do anything? It probably wasn't worth it. I'm being honest with you. All honesty, we just can't trust Princess Leia's claims in this moment. Just look at literally everything she has said up to this point in the movie. She starts by telling Vader that they're on a mission of peace. I mean, what are you talking about? I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. That is such a lie, Leia. We just saw your ship getting the plan, smiling with your digitally recreated face made by computer technology. Okay. Vader literally just experienced the events of Rogue One, watching the rebel ship fly away with the Death Star plans. Why would anyone from the Empire possibly believe you in this moment? But even still, even if there were weapons on Alderaan, it's not likely that everyone there was working for the Rebellion, so there's definitely plenty of innocent lives lost in that attack. I'm not saying that the Empire were the good guys by any means, I'm just saying they were more effective at ruling a galaxy. However, if you hold that action against the Empire, shouldn't you also be holding it against the Republic? Because, let's get real here, they also do their fair share of murder, and also at a near planetary scale. I'll let mm. the movie Clerks explain this. The first Death Star was manned by the Imperial Army, so when they blew it up, no problem, evil is punished. Second time around, it wasn't even done being built yet. I bet they brought independent contractors in on that thing. Plumbers, aluminum siders, Roofers, all those innocent contractors brought in to do the job were killed. Casualties oh. of the war they had nothing to do with. The hard truth is this there is blood on everyone's hands. And don't Ooh. for a second think that the Republic wasn't above those sorts of actions either. In Return of the Jedi, Luke manipulates the indigenous Ewoks of Endor, convincing them that C3PO was a golden god who would smite them if they failed to assist the rebels in their war efforts. C3PO, tell them if they don't do as you wish, you become angry and use your magic. Hmm. Let's see, pushing the indigenous people into your own military conflict, making them believe that God oh. is commanding them to do so. I know Vader and his friends are called the Empire, but if someone here is guilty of cultural imperialism, it's not the guys who are wearing stormtrooper outfits. Yeah, that is bad. <sighs> but then you gotta think about it. The Ewoks are very primitive people, so of course it was easy for them to get manipulated by, the, by Luke and his smooth-talking ways. Of course, they was yeah. They don't know much. They never they never been outside. They they never been off the world. They only been on the, in the jungle. They have been in the dirt, so they don't know anything. So that's why. I mean that quite literally too. The relationship that Luke has with the Ewoks stands in stark contrast to the way that the Empire treated them. Before the Rebels showed up, the Empire stormtroopers mostly ignored the Ewoks. They weren't destroying huge portions of the forest to create their shield generator. The design almost seems like it was created to minimize the environmental impact. The Empire wasn't trying to crush the Ewoks or even rule over them. The Empire and the Ewoks were both pretty much live and let live, peacefully coexisting without any sort of conflict, which again gets my main point about how life under the so-called oppressive empire wasn't really all that bad if you were a regular galactic citizen or a regular Ewok. It wasn't until Luke showed up and brought the Ewoks into his war that they started dying. Look, oh. let me reiterate this. I'm not saying the empire was perfect. In fact, it's pretty far from perfect. The emperor was basically a dictator. The empire is autocratic. I can totally see why Luke would be attracted to the idea of joining a rebellion to fight it. But if you compare the empire to what came before during the prequels and what came after after in the sequel trilogy, it starts to look like the best of the three systems to live under. The movies give us a skewed perception of what the Empire is. From the Rebels' perspective, of course the Empire is going to seem evil, because if you're in the Rebellion, the Empire is trying to kill all of your friends. However, the Empire is attacking the Rebels only because the Rebels are trying to destroy the Empire. For your average galactic citizen, life under the Empire was about as good as you could get. Or, as Werner Herzog's character puts it in the Mandalorian. The our main guy Mando might take issue with empire apologists like the client, deep in his heart he knows that life isn't actually better under the new republic. But hey, that's just, just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Yes. So we agree, the empire, they was fair, they was okay. Of course, dictators, of course you got dictators, and the republic, wasn't they really the best? Yeah, when you look at season seven of like, I think season seven towards the end of the Clone Wars, season seven of Star Wars Clone Wars, the siege of Mandalore at the end, how the the clones was treating the people, 
That seemed very oppressive. And the clones, did they really, man? But I like the clones, though. I have really, I grew up watching the prequels, and I grew up watching Star Wars The Clone Wars. So, of course, I have something with the prequels. I'm going to be attached to them. But, yeah. But if I had to rank them, prequels, and then, like, the Empire, so the Republic with the Clone Wars, the Empire, and then the new Star Wars. The new ones is okay, but, yeah, yeah I'm always going to be a prequels man. Thank you. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. And drop a video in the comments of what you want me to react to next. Have a good day.